Our guest today, Joanne Strauss, lovely Miss South Africa from 2000 and a businesswoman since then and uh, my colleague on the board of yes. Media24. Very happy to have you here. Thanks so much, Ruth. It's always lovely to chat to you, and especially in different capacities. So I'm looking forward to a good catch up. And we have spoken to Jack Paro, and Joanne says he's almost your neighbor. Absolutely. We actually live in the same neighborhood in Tambuscliff, so it seems to be this sort of bohemian mix right there. So yeah, we enjoy living in Cape Town. <laughs> I want to start your story in 2000. You were a student, you were doing law at the time, and then you entered a beauty competition and won. Yes. What change did that bring? Well, Ruda, at that point in time, I wasn't really as interested in world peace as I was interested in the brand new car that I could win with a pageant. But um, the change, yes, of course, as a student, staying in Minerva in my res to all of a sudden staying in a beautiful apartment in Santon and driving a beautiful car, having my first stamp in my passport. So I think in terms of change, it changed me a lot as a person, but it also changed me a lot in terms of seeing the other side, from student life to the glamour life. It was quite a taste of, of, of what, I, what I enjoyed, or what I thought I would enjoy as, as time went along. So yeah, it was, it was a great experience um, and definitely a big change event in my life. But you kept going with your studies. Did you have to make a conscious decision? Because the world of fashion and, and um, glamour can swallow you up. It's a fickle industry. Um, for me, my, my dad was adamant that I went back and finished my degree. So we had a lot of, um, I would call it healthy debate on the topic. And then finally I decided, yes, I went back and I finished my degree. So I did my BCom Law at Stellenbosch. And um, yes, my dad's still waiting for me to go and finish my LLB and my articles. But um, dad's going to wait a little bit longer, I think. <laughs> Are you glad that you did that? Did you in there? I, I am very glad. glad. Um, Ruda, I think for me it's also one of those things, um, the media industry is fantastic, but it also is an important thing for people to note that there's media and there's the show part of it, but there's also the business part. People always go, they love show business, there's show and there's business, and they sometimes forget that those two need to be seen together in context for you to actually become a successful person. Do you sometimes feel that you have to prove that you're more than just a pretty face? Ruda, it does, it does happen from time to time, but I think less now as I've become older. Um, as a 19-year-old Miss South Africa, yes, people do think you're there and instead of asking you valid questions about the economy, even though I had my, my, my major in economics, they'd go, oh, you're wearing a cute little dress today or this or that, and you'd sort of go there into a big meeting thinking, that's not all I know about. But um, yes, as, as you Grow, grow older and as you gain more experience it does become easier but I also think that sometimes it's actually a pro to be underestimated so you walk in and you're always going to have people on the back foot when you do mention that you know a bit more about the financial statements or whatever the case may be at that point in time. I found that when I first interviewed national party politicians in 1985 Yes, and I was however old I was, but they did not see me coming because yes. I was a young woman. In the Afrikaans culture, you You are... know how to bake cook sisters and that's it. <laughs> yeah, and so it can be an asset. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's, I think that's the great thing. I mean, now as, as times have progressed, people do expect more from women, but it is one of those things, as a young woman walking into a business environment, you are often underestimated. And moving on to tying the knot, mm. you're married to a German orthopedic surgeon. Yes. How do you bridge the culture gap? Well, I think firstly, my, my husband is from southern Germany. And I think there's, a, there's actually between the Bavarians, because they feel, yes, they're German, but they're very much Bavarian. Um, between the Bavarians and the Afrikaans um, cultures, there's a lot of um, synchronicity, if one had to call it that. Um, but he loves Cape Town. Um, he's actually he's worked a lot in, in various township hospitals here. It's very cute. He actually speaks Afrikaans with a very Cape Town accent. So he's like, <laughs> So it's, it's amazing. He's, he's, he absolutely embraces the culture of Cape Town, of South Africa. And I've, I've embraced his culture as well. So. Um, I'm actually going to the Oktoberfest, I'm going to wear my little dirndl, my little German dress and yeah, it's a bit of a change, but I enjoy it. How did being married change your priorities? 
I think when it comes to marriage, firstly, um, I often say to people that in today's society, people spend more time planning the wedding instead of planning the marriage. And the wedding is one day, the marriage is hopefully the decades and decades thereafter. And my husband and I, we, um, we read a book by George Chapman, Things I Wish I Knew Before We Got Married. Um, and we, we actually just spent quite a lot of time speaking about what it means to both of us be, being married. Um, but yeah, how things changed with marriage, I, I think because we've been together for such a long time, the relationship itself, one could say it's stronger because it's now in a more official sense, but um, I think it's important that you say I do every day. It is not just happening on the one day, that every day you make a conscious decision to be married. And um, I think that stood us in good stead. Yeah, I think being married 37 years now. Wow. <laughs> I'm taking notes from you then. <laughs> but yes, it, it is. You do, you do is, need to keep you saying must, I do. Yes, you, the consciousness yes. is unbelievably important mm. because you can so easily just drift along yes. and then drift apart. And take each other for granted. I yeah. think that's the other thing also is yeah. that the small little things, one has to notice the small little thank yous and the small little things also, that all of that sort of is the summation of a whole, yes. You kept your wedding very small. Yes. How does one choose only 30 people to come? Very difficult to have such a small wedding, especially from my culture. Um, but I think for my husband and I, we also said that if we have 31 people at our wedding, actually it was 30, 31 including the priest who decided <laughs> to stay for the party, which was great. Um, <laughs> Our priest also happens to be our neighbor. So yes, we do keep everything in the neighborhood. But um, it, was a, it was a big decision for us to just have a small, intimate wedding where we could concentrate on each guest that was there. And each guest meant something very special to us. And we had you know, subsequent parties afterwards to celebrate the fact that we were married. But the actual ceremony itself, that was very small and very intimate. Mm -hmm. What was the most unexpected part of, I don't think really being married, because as you say, it was one step in, yes. a, in an ongoing relationship, but in the relationship, in sharing your life, being part mm. of two. I think the, the most surprising part, if I really had to, had to put my finger on it, was probably the fact that you know now that a small fight doesn't mean shut the door and have silent treatment. A small fight which could become a big fight, you have to nip it in the butt. You've got to make, make sure that you actually go, okay, fine, what went wrong? Sort this out. No time for drama and, oh, I'm not going to speak to you. Silent treatment does not work. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you plan on being together for a long, long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you're investing consciously, consciously every day because Very today true. changes how tomorrow develops. Very no? true, yeah. Yeah. How did your work on top billing and all that stuff influence you when you had to set up your own house? Well, we could say that our house is very minimalist, but I'd actually just say it's undecorated. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been so busy. It went from the wedding, then having a baby, and it's just, I mean, I'm constantly on the road. Um, I spend so much time commuting between Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, we're, we're in the process of decorating, but I think that's also for us a lifelong process. So when I look at the top billing houses that are amazing and you walk in and it's turnkey, everything's amazing, our house is not quite there yet, but I like that. I like that. What makes a house a home? I think what makes a house a home is probably when there's heart and soul of the people living in it invested in the house and not just a blank paycheck. <laughs> I, I think I enjoy putting little pieces or even little quirky things that just my husband and I would understand in the house. And so, for example, when you see a little glass snail on one display cabinet, you know, okay, that glass snail represented blah, blah, blah. So um, I do think it's, it's got to have a sense of humor that comes from the owners. And um, one of my favorite books is from Khalil Gibran. It's called The Prophet. And he also speaks in there about a house and, and how um, houses also dream and they long to be in valleys with trees and all of that. And our house sort of feels like a tree house, which is what I enjoy about it. And for us, we sit, we discuss the long days over a glass of wine with a kachel, the fireplace on and just overlooking Cape Town. That makes it home for us. Where did you find each other? We found each other um, in Camps Bay um, nine years ago, on the 28th of August, yes. Um, nine years ago, um, I walked up to him, I said, you look nice, you dress well, this is Cape Town, are you gay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
which is a logical question in Cape Town. <laughs> and um, yeah, nine years later, we're happily married with a baby. It's a very <laughs> nice pickup line. Direct. <laughs> Absolutely, I wanted to know. And what's the point of like wasting time? I needed to know then, is it actually worthwhile investing any more time in the pursuit? So yes. <laughs> How long did it take before you knew that you were together? I think it was pretty much a case of, um, well, you could say love at first sight, but yes, yes. Mm. We, we, uh, a friend of mine had actually remarked that there goes my future husband, so she was right. <laughs> <laughs> and when you introduced him to your parents, someone so different? Um, my parents, no, they actually, I think they, they they fell in love with him from the beginning. I think he's also, again, the German culture and the South African culture, or the Afrikaans culture maybe, very, very similar. So they got along very quickly. And, and the new baby, not yes. so new? How old not is so it now? New. Five months old, five, five months. months old, yes. Yeah. Um, born it's on the international... the stage. Yes. It, he was born on International Happiness Day, so I think <laughs> that's a good omen. Um, so yeah, 20th of March he was born. Planned? Did you want him then? I definitely did. I think, you know, Rita, it's one of those things as well. As much as I enjoy being a career woman, I think motherhood is something, something that one is blessed to be. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, absolutely. I, I was planning at 33 and at 33 he came. So very, very blessed that everything happened according to plan. And how has he changed your life? I think to say that he's changed my life is probably a big understatement. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all consuming, but mm -hmm. I think it's also one of those things, I think very much a happy mother is a fulfilled mother. And mm -hmm. I've never been as tired in my life, but I've also never been as happy. So it is, it is one of those things. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to work on occasion. Um, I, I, do, I also think it's interesting when people say, yeah, oh, you're a stay-at-home mom, you don't really work. Stay-at-home moms actually work the most of any people that I've seen. And, and I'm trying to not be a stay-at-home mom, but even just the taste of stay-at-home momness <laughs> is quite overwhelming. Um, but yes, I, I think um, it is such a blessing to have a baby and I'm absolutely enjoying every single moment. But you've had to juggle the balls very carefully. Mm. I've re I read some, uh, some of your blogs. Yes. Um, What's your blog called? It's called Modern Mommy. So modernmommy.coza, modern yes. shameless punt. Um, yes. But yes, it's, it's, I sort of have my musings and my, my feelings on, on motherhood I sort of express there. I, I thought it was easier to do it that way instead of doing magazine articles about motherhood. It's, for me, that way it's what I want to speak about in terms of motherhood. And I try to keep my son out of the media so I don't really mention his name in media or there's no pictures out or there won't be any exclusive stories of the first pictures of him, but um, with Modern Mommy, it's just my chance to sort of share some thoughts on motherhood. It's difficult sometimes to be such a public face. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, Ruda, it, it is yes and no, because I think for me, I made a conscious decision to be involved in the world of media. My husband and my son did not. So that's why I try to keep things separate. But um, yes, um, my, my husband is a doctor. And for him, there's no glamour in what he does. My son, I, I don't want to have pictures out there. I think one day when he's old enough to say he wants to be in pictures, great. But until then, I'm going to try and protect him. But yes, um, I do manage to keep the private and the public life separate. So I think I've been relatively successful thus far. And practical pointers for women are forever struggling yes. with the balance thing. I think with the balance, it's sort of, you feel guilty when you're at home and you feel guilty when you're at work. And so, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, you're constantly trying to balance what is, what is more important. And it's not that the one is more important than the other or vice versa, but you just, you constantly feel guilty about where you are. Um, but, but in terms of the balance, I think the important thing is, firstly for me, my mom has been such an important figure in my life, especially now as, as a new mom. And I realize now how much my mom loves me because I think of how much I love my boy. Um, but in terms of the balance, it, it is important when people offer help, accept it. <laughs> I think sometimes being such a strong woman, you want to do everything yourself. But I've learned also that you do need to accept help. When friends offer, when they come around and they're like, you need to take a shower? Do you want to <laughs> hand the baby over? Say yes <laughs> when they offer to bring you something to eat for dinner because you're going to have takeaways for the fourth night in a row. Say yes, you know, so yes, accepting help and sometimes realizing that you're not superwoman. And the fact that you are not there all the time, how does that affect the relationship 
between your baby and his father? I think the important thing is a husband or a, a father, it is such an important role in a child's life mm -hmm. to have a father. Mm -hmm. And I've been very fortunate to have a very hands-on husband. Um, he loves fatherhood. Um, and is afraid also, of things getting messy. Isn't afraid. In <laughs> fact, I think he's probably changed more diapers than I have. <laughs> so he's absolutely amazing. Um, and I think, yes, I think fatherhood, especially in our country, in our generation, I think sometimes people underestimate the value of having a strong father figure. Um, and my, my son is absolutely in love with, with his dad. Of course, he's mommy's little boy, as all boys are, but um, his dad, he, his face lights up. His first smile was for his daddy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, it sounds as if you had a very close relationship with your dad. I do. Um, I, my, my dad is amazing. He is, we're very close. Yes, we do. Like I said, we have very colorful debates and we both have very strong walls. So it takes a while to convince him of my opinion. Um, but we're very, very close, and, and I think I'm, I'm a lucky woman to say that because my dad, you know, from, from being this very authoritative figure and always, you know, I must do this and I must study this and I must do that, um, we have fun, we chuckle. He often says to me, when am I going to get a real job? And um, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that's why he's still waiting for me to go and finish my, my articles and become a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, the joys of fatherhood. <laughs> what was the most unexpected part of being a mother? The fact that your time is never your own. Um, I actually mm. posted something on Instagram a few days ago and it was a picture of the bathroom door closed and a little hand underneath crawling through going, they will find you. <laughs> so going to have a shower is, a, is an absolute luxury these days, an uninterrupted shower. Or um, yes, it is, it is the fact that your time is definitely not your own anymore. So um, yeah, but I suppose it's not, I suppose I did expect it, but the, the sort of um, level of, of time consumption by such a little person, it's amazing how much such a little person needs. You don't get to read, we were talking about yes. the Media 24 <laughs> documents. Board packs, well, I remember that yes. I couldn't read more than a newspaper article because yes. you don't, there's not enough time. Well, this is, this is it. I, I, my husband was joking, okay, so I will actually show my little repetitive strain thumb injuries. My husband joked that it's because I'm sitting on my smartphone constantly <laughs> scrolling because that's the only way I can read these days is little bite-sized um, articles. But um, yes, it is, it is quite amazing to see how much time you have to invest. But again, the smaller they are, the more dependent they are on you. And I think I'm enjoying that. I think even when he starts to walk or is able to dish his own food into his mouth, I'm going to miss being the absolute go-to person for everything. So yeah, it is amazing. You started working quite quickly after yes. he was born. Was that a conscious decision or was it just life? Life. Um, I'd accepted the directorship with Media 24. At, the po at that time, I think I was seven months pregnant. So my first board meeting was supposed to be a week after giving birth. And I thought I would make it. And I ran to the car all dressed and I couldn't unfold my pram. And I didn't know how to get into the car with a baby seat. And so I only managed to go back to work two weeks after giving birth. But um, I did try a week after. But yes, it is... It is um, I enjoy working and I think a satisfied mom in terms of work, where I, I think whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a working mom, the most important thing is that as a mom that you're happy because that then reflects on your child as well. So I'm very lucky to be able to have a flexible kind of um, career where I am able to do both. And is it sometimes difficult to connect those two because your television persona is so glamorous? And being a mother is not. No. I'm currently, I'm hiding um, rice cereal spills and I think there's a little bit of apple puree somewhere underneath this jacket. Um, but I do think also what's, what, I, what I enjoy about my work is I get to put on the makeup and go and do something that's glamorous and I get to come home and put on my little scarf felt slippers and just be mom. So it, it actually makes you appreciate both sides a lot more. Good luck. And I hope you will be a very happy mum for the rest of your son's life. <laughs> Thank you so much. And hopefully there'll be more changes and we'll add more to the brood. <laughs> well, let's talk about that yes. when it happens. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joanne.